the liturgical year of Don Prosper Garanger. June 6, St. Norbert, Bishop and Confessor. The helpful influence of the Holy Ghost is more and more multiplied along the church's path. It seems as though he would show us today how the divine power of his action is not crippled by the lapse of years. For here we have 12 centuries after his first coming among us, miracles of grace and conversion, quite as brilliant as those that marked his glorious descent upon earth. Norbert, in whose veins flowed the best blood of emperors and kings, was from the very breast of his mother Hedwige, supernaturally invited to a nobility, loftier still, yet did he devote to the unreserved enjoyment of pleasure three and thirty years of a life that was to number but fifty in all. The Holy Ghost at length hastened to the conquest. There burst a sudden storm. A thunderbolt falls right in front of the prodigal, throwing him to the ground, making a frightful chasm between him and point whither a moment ago he was hastening to pursuit of new vanities that needs must fail as all others had done, to fill the hopeless void in his heart. Then, in the very depths of his soul resounds a voice, such as Saul once heard on his way to Damasus. Norbert, whither goest thou? Like another Paul, he replies, Lord, what wilt thou have me do? He is answered, Depart from evil and do good. Seek after peace and pursue it. Twenty years later, and Norbert, is in heaven, seated amidst pontiffs, upon a glorious throne, and all radiant with that special brilliancy that distinguishes the founders of the great religious orders when they have reached the eternal home. Deep are the traces left by him on earth of his few years of penitential life. Germany and France received his preaching. Antwerp is delivered from a shameful heresy. Magdeburg is rescued by this her archbishop from the irregularities that were sullying the house of God. Such are his works, and though these alone would have sufficed to a long life of holiness, yet they are not the only titles, nor the most brilliant, which Norberg has to the church's gratitude. Before being called against his will to the honors of the Episcopate, this once gay courtier made choice of an uninhabitable solitude amidst the forests of the diocese of Leon, wherein to devote himself to prayer and the maceration of his flesh. The renown of this holy penitent gained rapidly, and Premontre soon beheld her swampy marshes invaded by a vast multitude, formed of the fairest names of pick nobility, pressing thither to learn the science of salvation from the lips of the saintly anchorite. There too did Our Lady show to him, in vision, the white habit wherewith his disciples were to be clothed. And St. Augustine, in like manner, delivered to him his own rule. Thus was founded the most illustrious branch of the order of canons regular. They add to the obligation of solemnizing the divine office, the austerities of an uninterrupted penance, and devote themselves, moreover, to the service of souls by preaching and the administration of parishes. In the foregoing century, the episcopacy and papacy had been raised by the monks from out of the reach of feudal servitude, and Norbert was now raised up to give the needed completion to their work. Although, on principle, the monastic life excludes no sort of labor useful to the church, the monks could not, numerous they might be, quit their cloisters in order to undertake charge of souls. Yet great were the wants of the lambs of the flock at that time, for many unworthy pastors of secondary order, slaves to simony and immorality, still continued to lead astray the simple laity. The religious life was alone capable of raising the priesthood from such degradation, whether on the pinnacles of the hierarchy or amongst the lowest degrees of sacred orders. Norbert was the man chosen by God to effect, in part at least, this immense work and the importance of his mission explains the sublime prodigality wherewith the Holy Ghost multiplied vocations to his standard. The number and rapidity of foundations permitted succor to be promptly and everywhere afforded. Even into the far east did the light of Pramatre reach almost as its first dawn. In the 18th century, notwithstanding the devastations of the Turks 
and the ravages of the pretended reform, the order divided into 28 provinces still contained in nearly each one of its houses as many as from 50 to 120 canons, and the parishes that continued under their care might be counted by thousands. Nuns, whose holy life and prayers are the ornament and aid of the church militant, occupy from the very beginning the place deservedly their due in this numerous family. In the time of the founder, or soon after his death, there were more than a thousand of them. At Primantre alone, such an incredible sum gives us an idea of the prodigious propagation of the order from its very origin. Norbert, moreover, extended his charity to persons who, like Thibault, Count of Champagne, would gladly have followed him into the desert, but who were restrained by God's will in the world. He thus made a prelude to those pious associations which we shall see St. Francis and St. Dominic organizing in the 13th century under the name of Third Orders. The liturgy thus condenses the life of this great servant of God. Norbert, born of parents of the highest rank, thoroughly educated in his youth, in worldly knowledge, and then a member of the imperial court, turned his back upon the glory of the world and chose rather to enlist himself as a soldier of the church. Being an ordained priest, he laid aside all soft and showy raiment, clad himself in a coat of skins, and made the preaching of the word of God the one object of his life. Having renounced the ecclesiastical revenues which he possessed and which were very considerable, he distributed likewise his patrimony among the poor. He ate only once a day, and that in the evening, and then his meal was a Lenten fair. His life was a singular austerity, and he was used even in the depth of winter to go out with bare feet and ragged garments. Hence came that mighty power of his words and deeds, whereby he was enabled to turn countless heretics to the faith, sinners to repentance, and enemies to peace and concord. Being at Lyon, the bishop besought him not to leave his diocese, and he therefore made choice of a wilderness at a place called Premontre, whither he withdrew himself with 13 disciples, and thus he founded the order of Premontretensians, whereof he received the rule in the holy vision from St. Augustine. When, however, the fame of his holy life became every day more and more noised abroad, and great numbers sought to become his disciples, and the order had been approved by Honorius II and other popes, many more monasteries were built by him, and the institute wonderfully extended. Being called to Antwerp, he there gave the death blow to the shameful heresy of Tanchelin. He was remarkable for the spirit of prophecy and for the gift of miracles. He was created, albeit against his will, Archbishop of Magdeburg, and as such was a strong upholder of the discipline of the church, especially as regards celibacy. At a council held at Reims, he was a great help to Innocent II and went with other bishops to Rome, where he repressed the schism of Peter de Leon. At last, this man of God, full of good works and of the Holy Ghost, fell asleep in the Lord at Magdeburg in the year of salvation, 1134, on the sixth day of June. Thou didst indeed know how to redeem the time, as was fitting in those evil days, wherein thou thyself, O Norbert, led away by the example of the senseless crowd, hast for so long frustrated the designs of God's love. Those years, at first refused by thee to the true master of the world, thou didst at length return unto him, multiplied a hundredfold. Through those countless sons and daughters, thou didst train up in sanctity. Even thy personal works, in but twenty years' space, filled the whole earth. Schism crushed, heresy confounded to the glory of the Most Holy Sacrament, which it had already dared to attack, the rights of the Church, intrepidity defended against worldly princes and unjust retentions, the priesthood restored to its primitive purity, the Christian life strengthened on its true basis, namely prayer and penance, such and so many victories achieved in so few years, are due to the generosity which prevented thee from looking back for
for one moment from the day wherein the Holy Ghost touched thy heart. Do thou make all understand that it is never too late to begin to serve God. Were it even, as in thy case, the evening fall of life, what yet remains of time would quite suffice to make us saints, if we would but generously give that little fully to heaven. Faith and patience were thy cherished virtues. Make them flourish once more in this sad world of ours, which vaunts itself on doubting of everything, and with jive and jeer hurries onward to the abyss of hell. Forget not, dear apostle, now that thou art in heaven, the countries thou didst formerly evangelize, we implore this of thee, despite their forgetfulness, despite their criminal return to the deceits of the devil. Holy Pontiff, Magdeburg has lost her ancient faith, and therewith the precious relics of thy body, which she no longer deserved to possess. Prague is now the favored spot of thy repose. But while blessing this hospital city, pray still for the ungrateful one that has cast aside her double treasure. O thou founder of Prémontré, smile once more on France, who derives from thee one of her fairest glories. Obtain from God that, for the salvation of these calamitous times, thine order may recover something of its former splendor. Bless, few as they are, those sons and daughters of thine who, despite the ridiculous hospitality of the powers that be, seek to shed once more their beneficent influence on France. May our own England benefit also from their return to her midst, and may their fruits be multiplied in every direction. Maintain thine own spirit among them. May they find in interior peace the secret of triumph over Satan and his crew. May the full magnificence of the divine worship Solomon carried out be ever unto their souls as the dearly loved mount, whence Moses like they may declare the will of the Lord unto the new Israel, the Christian people.